Welcome to Just Have a Drink. Mixologist. I hate this word. I hate being called a mixologist. Commonly, mixologist is used to describe a bartender, one that usually makes great cocktails, has a vast knowledge in their craft, or stands out above most ordinary bartenders. At the end of this video, you'll completely understand why I hate the term mixologist. This is just a personal opinion, so no offense to anybody that uses it, but they are just doing their job. I don't call the garbage man a waste removalologist. I don't call the bag boy a grocery store advanced food packaging engineer. I get it. We want to distinguish bartenders that use fresh and unique ingredients and advanced techniques to make amazing looking and tasting balanced cocktails from somebody that just pours together a Jack and Coke and uses sweet and sour. But what if I told you that they were just correcting almost 100 years of bastardizing one of the greatest American creations? This is the rise and fall and rise again of cocktails in America. The history of the cocktail and how it became what it is today is such a fascinating story that many don't know. One report states that 60% of adult Americans are consuming alcohol at an average of almost four beverages a week. I wish I had the real quarantine numbers from 2020 because everybody I knew was lit like a Christmas tree before lunch. Even though most Americans consume adult drinks, the world of spirits, cocktails, and bartending seems to be one of the most misunderstood subjects out there. If you've ever gone bar hopping, you might have realized that not all bars are created equal. You might have ordered something like a whiskey sour and thought it was amazing, then went to five other bars, ordered the same thing, and it tasted like crap. Why is this? The beginning of this story takes place between the American Revolution and Prohibition. Distilled spirits had been around for hundreds of years, but it was kind of harsh. To make these spirits more palatable, punches were made. People took large containers, added alcohol, sugar, lemon, spices, and water together to make a punch. Think about your college days of making jungle punch for that epic party. That was a lot of drink for one person though, so the sling was created, which was a single serving of spirit water and sugar. In 1806, we got the written definition of a cocktail, which was a spirit, sugar, bitters, and water. This resembles the old fashioned that we know and love today. Later, the definition of a cocktail was amended to include a sour. This would include sour style cocktails like a daiquiri. A bartender was given a spirit and would use a sweetener, bitters, and water to make the spirit easier to drink. Bartenders at that time were responsible for making their own types of sweeteners, bitters, mixers, and sometimes booze. There was no local grocery store and no online store with two-day shipping. Eventually, ice houses began taking ice from frozen lakes and making ice widely available to the public. Bartenders also started experimenting with all types of ingredients, from berries, spices, herbs, tonics, and eventually fancy liquors from overseas. During this time, America was looked down at by European countries, maybe because America was so young, or maybe because the American underdogs kicked British butts right out of the country. Who really knows? It's all tea water under the bridge now. But Europe adopted the cocktail, calling it the first culinary contribution from America. The creative drinks and personalized service soon made these bartenders celebrities. First one, Cato Alexander, a black slave who would get his freedom later. Many others would become celebrities in their own right, like Jerry Thomas, the professor. He wrote the first cocktail book, The Bartender's Guide. His creativity and showmanship made him one of the top bartenders at the time. His signature drink, the Blue Blazer, is one of the earliest examples of flair bartending. This new trendy wave of culinary art, amazing drinks, outstanding customer service, flashy showmanship, celebrity bartenders was about to come to a crashing end. How you may ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Prohibition. While I love America for all of its greatness, it's not without its faults. There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. If fool me, we can't get fooled again. Bars were a great place to be at during that time. But like most of America, during that time, it was only great if you were white and had a penis. Overconsumption had become a real problem. Men would drink themselves to death. Also, a lot of men would get off of work, spend their whole entire paycheck at the bar, then go home and beat their wife and children. The problem was so bad, people would do anything to fix it. 
like Carrie Nation, who was infamous for walking into a bar with a hatchet, threatening every drinker and destroying the bar. Before the National Prohibition Act in 1920, most states had already adopted their own state prohibition. In order to save lives, improve family living, and prevent the abuse of alcohol and people, prohibition began January 17, 1920, under the terms of the 18th Amendment. This almost ended the greatness of the cocktail. This began the fall of the cocktail in America. All of these great bartenders that created these wonderful cocktails with all of their knowledge were now out of a job. So almost all of them picked a new job or just took their talents overseas. And just like that, all the experience was gone from America. But not all the bars. You can make something illegal, but doesn't mean that people stop doing it. It actually made drinking more popular. You tell someone that they can't do something and they'll want to do it even more. It was the Roaring Twenties. Speakeasy started popping up everywhere. These hidden in plain sight bars usually needed a password or a secret handshake to enter. They were usually ran by criminals like the mob. The bartenders that worked these speakeasies were generally young men with no experience that weren't bothered by working for the mob and were like the NWA, fuck the police. They were not afraid of being arrested. While many believe that many great cocktails came from this era, that's completely false. The few great cocktails that did come from this era generally were created overseas. The alcohol served in these speakeasies weren't the greatest quality. Aid spirits like whiskey was expensive, but spirits like gin was cheap and easy to make. The poor quality of bathtub gin combined with the inexperience of these new bartenders ended up with crappy cocktails. But this was the Roaring Twenties, the Gatsby era. Even though alcohol was prohibited, the party wasn't going to stop. Feminism was in full swing, women were also drinking. Drinking wasn't cheap though, enjoyed mainly by the middle and upper class. The equivalent today would be like bottle service in the club. But speakeasies would continue to flourish throughout prohibition, after paying off the police and other city officials. But now we get to post-prohibition. We'd get a new style of cocktail and the complete destruction of the art of the cocktail. Many argued if prohibition was a success or a failure, but at the end of prohibition, Americans had enough. They just wanted to drink. America also was in the middle of the Great Depression, and Uncle Sam needed money. Some reports claim that $11 billion was lost in federal liquor tax revenue, and $310 million was spent on prohibition enforcement from 1920 to 1931. During Prohibition, some distillers legally remained open like Old Forester, and some people were granted medical cards for the use of alcohol. Sounds familiar? Yeah. The combination of people wanting to drink legally and the government wanting to get paid? The 21st Amendment was ratified, and Prohibition was repealed. Bars began to pop up everywhere across America. But the cocktail did not rise back to the greatness. American distillers were starting from scratch and the experienced bartenders were nowhere to be found. Many theme bars would start popping up, one of these being tiki bars. These specialized in tropical style of drinks and experimented a lot with rum. Leading the forefront in tiki culture was Don the Peachcomber and Trader Vic. Most notable drinks were the Mai Tai, Pina Colada, Singapore Sling, and the Zombie. The Zombie is what the Long Island wish it was. The Zombie was so strong it had a limit of two. While Tiki Bar started at the end of Prohibition, it wouldn't be until the 1950s till it became a craze. And soon, cocktails would enter its darkest moment in history. In the 1950s, the newest cocktail craze at the time was suburban cocktail parties. Similar to the 1920s, these parties were more about socializing and less about the taste of their cocktails. Tasting cocktails shifted from complexity and flavor to just getting the job done. This began the darkest moment in American cocktail history. The popular cocktail for men at the time was a vodka martini with the slightest splash of vermouth, and women were enjoying sweeter cocktails like grasshoppers and white Russians. At the same time, America was changing in another way. Inventions like vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, and the microwave were widely available to most Americans. The people got really used to convenience, a lot of times over quality. Perfect example, TV dinners. What would really be convenient for these suburban cocktail parties would be creating a pre-made mix so people could socialize more and spend less time mixing up cocktails. Pre-made cocktails and artificial sour mix with chemicals nobody can pronounce became a thing. So what they tasted horrible and nothing like the real thing. It was convenient. 
This would continue throughout the 60s, but the generation that followed didn't want to be like their non-hit parents. So by the 70s, the younger generation turned to wine, but these boomers weren't that sophisticated in wine drinking. So they drank younger, sweeter wines like White Ziffendale, Boone's Farm, and wine coolers. By the late 80s, cocktails were back in popularity in America, but the cocktails were horrible. The nicest way to put it, it was a huge dumpster fire. This was the disco era of cocktails. Every shortcut possible was taken. Fresh ingredients were out, and instead, chemical products that tasted horrible was used. Also, drinks were incredibly sweet. Neat trick. Anything that doesn't taste good, add a bunch of sugar to trick people into thinking it's good. Food companies been doing it for decades. This is a fun one. Rose's Grenadine. Who doesn't know this bright red abomination? Bartenders during that time poured it into everything. Add a lot of sugar and bright red pretty colors and you have yourself a cocktail. This bright red grenadine tastes nothing like the real grenadine. Grenadine is supposed to be pomegranate flavored and normally darker in color. It's surprising how many people think it's supposed to be cherry flavored. This era gave us sex on the beach, screaming orgasm, slippery nipple, slow comfortable screw against the wall. Thanks to a lack of knowledge, cheap products and popular movies with zero Zero research, cocktails saw their darkest moment in American history. Now I know that many American bars are still like this and for many Americans this is the norm and they like these drinks. Drink what you like, like what you drink. But if you've never had a craft cocktail, try it, compare it, and you'll see what I mean. I speak from personal experience when I say people would rather pay for a good cocktail than take a free crappy one. And now the 2000s, the cocktail revival. Bartenders brought back fresh, natural, custom-made ingredients, creativity, and well-balanced cocktails. These craft cocktail bars are what's booming right now. Del DeGroff, the godfather of the cocktail revival in the U.S., was originally opposed to using fresh ingredients. It, it's extra work. But he would end up leading American cocktails back to greatness. Bars like Milk and Honey would shape the way for these new speakeasy bars. Bartenders aren't just throwing liquid into a glass and calling it a day. They're learning, adapting, and improving from cocktails from the past, and they're making cocktails for the future. While bars' emphasis on a great time is still key, there's no reason that you can't have a great cocktail at the same time. Which brings me back to the word I hate. Mixologist. It's not that I dislike it because it sounds like a pretentious name for a bartender. It's because I want great cocktails to be the norm and just be able to go to any bar and just have a drink. Cheers.